are here moving in our midst I worship you I worship you you are here working in this place I worship you I worship you you are here touching every heart I worship you I worship you you are here healing every heart I worship you I worship you you are darkness my god that is who you are you are way make miracle work promise keep a light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are here moving in our midst i worship you I worship you you are here working in this place I worship you I worship you you are here touching every heart I worship you I worship you you are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are the way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You
Hey, I'm Reverend Katrina Drew, one of the pastors of Salem and pastor of our South City site, The Connection. We're excited that you're here with us for this worship experience. Today, we want you to know that if you want to get more involved with our church, we would love for you to, and we invite you to fill out a Connect card. That's how we'll get to know you better. You can let us know your prayer requests or other ways you'd like to be involved. The link for that, if you're on Facebook or YouTube, should be below in the comments. We're also excited to tell you about Connect Groups. We're in a new series right now called Do Over. The beginning of a new year is a time when everybody's writing New Year's resolutions and wants a fresh start, a do over. A great way to have a fresh start is to go deeper in your faith with others. If you want a sense of true Christian community in a small group that you do life with, a connect group is a great way to do that. So we're gonna be sharing stories each week from members of connect groups at our church. Right now, we invite you to listen to the story of Samantha and David Long. But before we listen to their story, we invite you to pause for just a moment. Let's begin worship and prayer together. Will you pray with me? God of wonder, we give you thanks that through it all, no matter what changes we see in our nation, what changes we see in our communities, what changes happen in our own lives, you are constant and you remind us that you are always with us. During this time, help us to focus on you, focus in on your spirit present with us wherever we are sitting or standing or watching from. Be with us now in this time of worship, amen. Hi, we're David and Samantha Long. We joined the Connect Group in January of 2019 because we wanted to grow our relationship within Salem and other members of the community. In our Connect Groups, we meet every other week on a weeknight typically, and we used to make dinner for each other, but we got really tired of doing that, so we just ordered tacos from our favorite taco joint. I'm really thankful for our Connect Group due to the relationships that we've been able to build over these last two years. I'm really being able to have true friendships and go through life together in all of its ups and downs. the throne of God above, I have a strong and guilty plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart, I know that while in him he stands, no tongue can be then steep on No tongue can bid me Then steep on When Satan tempts me To despair And tells me of The guilt within Upward I look And see him there Who made an end To all my sin Because the sin Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just then satisfied To look on Him and pardon me To look on Him and pardon me Behold Him there, the risen Lamb My perfect spotless righteousness the great unchangeable I am The King of glory and His grace One with Himself I cannot die My soul is purchased by His blood My life is hid with Christ on high With Christ my Savior and my God With Christ my Savior and my God
everybody, welcome to Salem. My name's Sean, I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you so much for choosing to spend some time and worship with us whenever you are and from wherever you are. And I gotta tell you, and I'm not just saying this because I'm always excited for it, but I am so excited for the message today. I truly believe that it could change your life. Last week, Pastor Terry gave an awesome, awesome message about uprooting the weeds in our lives and hearts by repenting and asking God to take them away. Today, we're going to talk about the cycle of guilt and shame we're a part of even after we repent and how to get out of that cycle. I'm so outside of myself pumped to dive in together with you, but I would love to pray together first. Loving God, we confess that we've sinned and that we've made mistakes, that we hate the guilt and shame and regret that so often hold us captive. We allow our sins and mistakes and guilt to haunt us and to define our self-identity, which only leads to more sin and guilt. We want to live free, and we know that when we get to worship, we feel freer than ever. So reveal to us today, through your word, that your love has set us free, and just what that means for us. Amen. Okay, by now you're probably wondering why I'm sitting in a gym. This is my friend's home gym. She has an amazing setup. And it just makes me think, man, if I had this at my house... I, yeah, I'd probably never use it. <laughs> but of course, this is the time of year when we make and celebrate New Year's resolutions. And so many of them involve wellness and health and exercise. Do you make a New Year's resolution? Maybe it's not going so well. Maybe it's going well. Either way, drop it in the comments and let us know. And I know I've had my fair share of resolutions. And if you're anything like me, usually the resolutions that you make are based off of mistakes or regrets from the past. Like maybe living an unhealthy lifestyle makes you want to eat healthier and exercise. Poor time management? Then I'm gonna put the practice of my faith and family and friends before anything else. Maybe we regret that we didn't reach reconciliation with something or someone, so now I'm gonna practice forgiveness like never before in the coming year. Whatever it is or was or might be for you, you can fill in the blank yourself. I'm sure you can find something in your own life, but I think what New Year's resolutions teach us is that there's a widespread desire to be a better version of ourselves. But the problem is, resolutions also teach us that we are terrible at actually doing what we want to do, or we are really good at doing what we don't want to do. Because over 80% of resolutions completely fail, and of that 80%, the majority of those fail by the time February rolls around. There is no doubt that this happens because we approach our resolutions the wrong way. Most of the time, we end up placing too much or all the weight on ourselves, and we're left to just strong arm what we desire. And the weight of that just ends up crushing us and leaving us in despair. And yet we try the same tactics over and over and over again, sometimes annually, sometimes more than annually, only to get the same results. We just end up giving up and are left upset and blaming ourselves and seeing ourselves as a failure. And I think as Christians, we treat our faith largely the same way. We allow our mistakes to define us and we think of ourselves as bad or wrong or evil, which starts this cycle. Like I mentioned last week, Pastor Terry talked about how when we repent, God uproots the sinful and unhealthy weeds we have in our lives. So repentance is like New Year's Eve, when we turn from our old ways and declare that we are made new. We are committed to living in a new way. And we feel free, because that's what repentance does for us. But after we repent, what do we tend to do? We repent, and then we try so hard to do better because of how we've identified ourselves. We try to do better, but inevitably we make mistakes and then we repent again. And we're caught in this cycle of forgiveness, mistakes, regret, repentance, and forgiveness. And even after we repent, we know we're forgiven, but often the shame and regret still remain. We fail at our faith resolutions again and again. But I think just like we have the wrong approach to our resolutions that leave us caught in this cycle of failure, we have the wrong approach to our repentance and just how we've been forgiven that leaves us caught in a cycle as well. It's like this. I think followers of Jesus usually handle repentance and shame and pain and regret 
in their faith life and relationship with Jesus in one of two ways. One way is like this. We're living our life, walking along the path, doing our thing, and we make a mistake. Maybe we tell lies. And we think, okay, this isn't too bad. We can, we can handle this, no problem. But then we say something really hurtful to a loved one. And then more guilt comes from what we did. And now, now we find ourselves really hung up on wishing we had more money or the same talents as other people. And we allow things one by one or maybe more to add up to so much that we crash and burn altogether. And it's only at this point we call out to Jesus and say, okay, I was wrong. Can you take this stuff from me? I need help. But then we start over doing the exact same thing over and over again. And it is exhausting. Or maybe another approach that some of us take that you can identify with is like this. This time I'm doing my thing, but this time I've got Jesus with me. I've got Jesus walking with me. Ha, this is great. Then I spend a little bit too much time thinking about that girl in the gym with the yoga pants. You know who I'm talking about. And we think, hey, Jesus, could you help me carry this? Thanks, man. That's awesome. And then I start prioritizing my work life over my faith or family life. And hey, Jesus, mind helping a brother out? That's awesome. Cool. You're the best. Thanks. Then comes along something that isn't even sinful, but it's just weighty and difficult and painful. Maybe a loved one is terminally ill. You think, Jesus, this is getting tough, but I know we can handle it together. And more sin and regret and pain come around. And this method may last a little longer, and it may feel more pious or holy or saintly. But is this really that much better than when I didn't have Jesus' help at all? I mean, we're still carrying this stuff that we don't have the power to carry or get rid of. Is this really the gospel? Is this really all the good news has to offer? It seems like there's so much I'm told that I'm offered by Jesus, but this just seems to end up leaving me disappointed and sad and tired either way. Well, friends, the truth is, it isn't the gospel. And the real good news is actually so much better than that. But I must confess that often the messages that we think we hear in church worship services or small groups or Bible studies is, yeah, you've been forgiven, but if you really want to get rid of all of that weight and all of that baggage and all that guilt, you have to love God more. You have to work harder. You have to try harder, just like we do for our New Year's resolutions. But we just talked about how that ends up happening. And this idea leaves us saying phrases like, if only I loved God more, then I would or wouldn't have done that. If only I wanted God the way that I know I should, then I would obey him. See, this means we're blaming our own hearts, our own minds, and our own very selves as being not good enough or not worthy. We make ourselves guilty. Our self-identities are now placed in our sin, mistakes, and regret instead of in Christ. And this is a lie that comes from a very, very dark place. It isn't true and it isn't of God. God says that for those who are in Christ Jesus, what they do is not who they are. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul actually writes about this very idea. And in chapter 7, he says something that on the surface makes us want to stand up and clap and agree with. He writes this, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Maybe in other words, I mess up. I need a do-over. And we all understand this feeling. But this is often where we stop actually paying attention to the whole passage. You see, in this passage, the Apostle Paul who wrote it is definitely not saying, well, don't, take, don't, don't be so hard on yourself. Because even I, the Apostle Paul, still struggle with things in life. And I sin and I make mistakes. So don't be so hard on yourself. It's part of life. Just keep at it and look forward to when Jesus returns and takes this plight off of us. If you read on, you find that he is in fact actually saying the exact opposite of that. Later in chapter 7, he has the audacity to say this. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. What does that mean? Is Paul like blaming a different personality or something within himself? 
Let's read on. Verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul is saying that when we accept Jesus, when we are believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that despite our sinful flesh, despite the mistakes that we make, we are still free. Now flip the page to the next chapter, just one verse later. Chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You see, Jesus has done for us what we could never possibly do for ourselves. So what you try to achieve by gritting your teeth and trying harder to fix in your life has already been fixed, has already been redeemed. The past mistakes that rob you of joy are gone forever. You have been set free from it all by Jesus. It is no longer you who does what you hate, but the sin that lives in your flesh. How is this possible? How does this make sense? Because once you repent and accept Jesus, you are not in flesh, you are in spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Or in another place, Paul says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So he says, once you follow Jesus, God's love is poured into your heart. You have the heart of God. Not because you don't make mistakes, but because the grace of God has given you God's own heart. And so now, as it says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. And here's how Paul elaborates on that and says what that means for us. He says in Romans 8, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who has been raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Straight from God's word to your ears, your sin, your mistakes, your regrets, your guilt, your shame do not disqualify you from the love of God. Not only do they not disqualify you, but they have been removed from you and completely destroyed. Because of Jesus, though we still sin, we are yet free from sin. Jesus intercedes on our behalf and says, Stop making yourself pay the price. Why do you toil and fret and worry and blame? It is finished. It's the evil one in the world that tries to convince us that there is something more that we have to do to change. That there is effort we have to give to remove the sin and regret from our life. But the truth is Jesus has already embodied that change for us and given it to us. In John 8, 36, Jesus says that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Jesus has already removed that sin from you. So live freely. When Jesus encounters the woman caught in adultery and invites all who are without sin to cast the first stone at her, they all leave. And Jesus is left with the woman and he asks her, Who has condemned you? And the woman says, No one. Jesus replies, Neither do I. And with those words, Neither do I, the woman is empowered by Jesus to do what he says next. 
Go and sin no more. The woman is now free to live with the power and confidence that she is without condemnation. And so are all followers of Jesus. Because of Jesus, what you do is not who you are. You don't have to work harder to love God more or try harder to be perfect anymore. You do love God. You do delight in what God asks of you. Not because of anything that you have done, but because it is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. And so I urge you that it is high time to stop living as if you are still the same person with some help from God. It's time to stop only living freely after we crash and burn and ask for forgiveness after things really hit the fan. It's time to start living as the beautiful and made perfect image of God that you are. You can stop praying for change and praying for deliverance over and over again every time mistakes happen. We can stop praying for more willpower to do better because it has already been done. It has already been changed. You have already been delivered and you are free. And freedom is not simply having the ability to choose or simply having the Holy Spirit to lean on or simply that we have God there to help us. True freedom is living a life with the confidence that all the work has already been done for us. We just get to enjoy living a life as the walking, redeemed image bearers of the Creator whose life is an act of worship. No more should you live under the weight of shame. No longer do you have to feel the pressure of the expectations you place on yourself. No more does the worry of sin control you. The expectations and pressure and hate and judgment of others have no claim on you. Because what you do is not who you are. Because it is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. That's good news. That's the ultimate do-over. And we don't have to try over and over again. It's a do-over once and for all, completed by Christ for all, on the cross and through the empty grave. And now it's our job to walk together in the freedom afforded us by the love and grace of Jesus. Amen.
Hey, thank you so much for worshiping with us. It was such a joy to have you together alongside of us. We really want you to know that there is so much happening in this faith community. Connect groups are happening. Outreach ministry is happening. Youth ministries are still happening. Kids ministries are still happening. And it takes so much to make these happen. And we want you to be a part of it. And you can also support all these things by taking the next step of giving. Giving allows these ministries to continue and to continue to flourish and reach out into the community around us at a time when it's so desperately needed. You can find that information there before you and even more information on our website. Once again, thanks so much for joining us. We're so glad you did. We hope you are too. See you next time.